hi everybody. This is uh, Debbie Moran, and tonight we're missing our president, Joe Califf, who usually makes the introductions. I just want to let you know that you are at the novice meeting of the Houston Astronomical Society. I am the novice chair, and uh, this meeting is for those who may be new to astronomy. We will be discussing observing Jupiter and Saturn tonight. Fortunately, tomorrow night at our main meeting, we have a fabulous speaker, Dr. Kevin Peter um, Hand, who is a planetary scientist, and he'll be able to answer any super technical questions about the planets, which I'll be introducing tonight. He's going to be speaking about the oceans and other parts of the solar system, where there may be some searches for uh, microbial life or bacterial life. And actually, some of those planets that we'll be looking at today have moons that might have those oceans. So we have a great double header tonight and tomorrow. Um, so tonight, again, I'm Debbie Moran, novice chair. I've been a member of the Houston Astronomical Society since 1980. And uh, I've pretty much learned everything I know about observing by being a member. So I wanna welcome you all and hope you'll take advantage of everything we have to offer if you're a new member. And if you have any questions, we're always here to answer them. I'm going to go ahead and attempt to share my screen. And I've got Sonny Manley here who's able to unmute himself. And I'm going to ask him if we're seeing the presentation. So Sonny, can you let me know if the presentation is being shared? Yes, uh, we see the giants Jupiter and Saturn in opposition. It's, your, uh, it's the uh, PowerPoint view. OK, great. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, the slide view. You see that okay? Yep. Okay, well, here we go. So Good. tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Jupiter and Saturn because um, we actually have a month, August, where they're both at opposition. And we'll talk about why that's important. I pretty much grew up looking at Jupiter and Saturn um, as a child because this is my 1960s planet poster, still has Pluto on it too, somewhere in there. And of course, you can see that Jupiter and Saturn are quite dominant in my uh, room that I was growing up in. Um, this is the free sky map that you can download at skymaps.com. And for each month, it will show you uh, currently where the planets are in the early evening. So you can go to skymaps.com, click on download the latest issue. And then on the next screen, scroll down and choose the top map. And this will be um, designed for the Northern Hemisphere. It may be optimized more for New York than for Houston, but it will be approximately right for us, for our latitude. And it's only good for the early part of the evening. But uh, we can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in the lower left, southeast part of the map, we can see that Jupiter is near um, the constellation Aquarius. And Aquarius is a water carrier. Um, he has a sort of a, a, a diamond head and he's leaning over, carrying, pouring some water. And next to it is Saturn, in the, right in the middle of the constellation of Capricornus, which is the sea goat. You will also notice that they are along a dotted line. This is called the ecliptic. And you may recognize the constellations along the ecliptic. You have Virgo, Libra, Scorpius, Sagittarius, Capricornus, and Aquarius, all visible in the early evening. Those are the constellations of the zodiac. But astronomically, those are the constellations that are in line of sight of the plane of the solar system. So when we look toward the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, or even the inner planets, they will always be along this line, which is line of sight with the plane of the solar system. So just to get an idea of how high up they may be, again, this is from Sky and Telescope magazine. So it may be more geared for the latitude 40 degrees up near Boston and New York. So, but this is approximately the arrangement of Jupiter and Saturn in mid-August. And for us, it's a little bit higher in the sky. Um, but they're fairly low in the southeast, but not so low that we can't get an excellent view of them. So why now? Well, Saturn was in opposition at opposition just a few days ago on August 2nd, and Jupiter will be in opposition on August 20th. So why opposition? Well, this is a time where we are closest to those planets and they are most rewarding to look at in the telescope because they are apparently much larger size. So this is, gives you kind of a schematic. Um, you can see when 
where the earth is, opposition literally means opposite us from the sun. So when a pl outer planet is at opposition, it is opposite in the exact opposite direction of the sun. What this means is that it will be highest up at midnight. Um, at dusk, it would appear from our point of view to be rising in the east and it would set in the west at dawn. So it'd be up all night, but actually it's the uh, highest and easiest to see in the late hours of the night, say between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So what that means is that as we get a little bit past opposition, we actually can get a better view, say for children who can't stay up so late because at that time, say in September and October, the planets will have already risen. They'll be a little bit higher. They'll be a little bit smaller, but they will be in a better place to observe early in the evening. So this gives you an idea of the difference that apparent size makes, say between opposition and not being at opposition. If the planet is too close to the sun, we can't see it at all. It's essentially up during the daytime. I've seen Venus during the daytime, but you've got to know where it is. Uh, but most, most plants you're not gonna be able to see during the daytime. So we can see them as they come close to the sun, but not as they actually get in the, too much in line of sight of the sun and are up in the daytime. So this gives you kind of a maximum minimum size of the planet Jupiter um, in say 2011, when it was farther away, and in 2012 when it was at opposition. So opposition for Jupiter happens about once every 389.9 days. What that means is that we are moving quite a bit faster than Jupiter. So most of that time is us going through our year. And then when we come back around to Jupiter, it's moved a little bit farther along its path. So we need a little bit of extra time to catch up to it. So this just gives you an idea of the path of Jupiter for a number of years. It starts on the right side of the map in 2018 and 2019 and proceeds to 2020. And now we're in the 2021 part of the path, the, the yellow dates. And notice that the path moves to the left, then it zigzags back to the right, moves to the left, zigzags back to the right. And, and again, it's doing that right now. So here we are in August, we're in the middle of a zigzag. And that zigzag where the planet appears to be moving leftward in the sky and then spends a little time, a few months moving to the right is called retrograde grade motion. So that sort of puzzled the ancients. Why are the planets suddenly changing direction? Well, this uh, GIF here gives you an idea of why that is. So here's theoretically between Earth and Mars. And I'll let it run a couple of times. How the line of sight to that planet changes as we and our faster orbit pass up an outer planet. I'll let it run one more time. I think there it goes. So anytime we are at opposition, we are at the point where, we're, where we are passing up the planet and moving faster than it. And it's often in, it is in retrograde at that time. Um, here's an idea, just some statistics about Jupiter. It's uh, here's sort of the relative sizes of the planets here. Jupiter is uh, about 317 times the mass of the Earth. It's 12 Earth diameters wide. So the Earth would actually fit inside the great red spot. And it's approximately 5 AU. That means astronomical units from the sun. An astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the sun, which is about 93 million miles. And so Jupiter is about five times that distance from the sun which is about 483,000 plus miles. Um, this is just a pretty picture and imagination of what Jupiter might look like from one of its closer large moons, Europa. Its composition, uh, these are maybe failed stars in a way. So Jupiter, if it were about 20 times larger, it could have possibly ignited into a star and we would have been part of a double star system. So its outer uh, atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium and uh, a lot of what stars are made of. And then you've got some metallic hydrogen inside and then below that, a rocky ice core. Um, the planets do not have a well-defined surface. So the outer planets, so they're first clouds and then they get turned into a liquid and then get slushy and then become finally reach a core. But things get gradually hard. You can't just find a surface of Jupiter to stand on. Um, to, to observe the planets, um, there are ideal combinations of telescopes and eyepieces. So for planetary observing, you want a relatively long, what we call focal length. So maybe in this 
um, maybe no shorter than six or seven. That's how long it takes the rays to come to a of light, to come to a focus after it hits the surface which focuses it. So after it hits a lens, in the case of a refractor like this, it, um, this refractor has, is uh, 7.3 times as long as the diameter of the lens to, by the time it gets to your eyes. And um, the refractors are actually the very best uh, planetary observing instruments, but they're also by far the most expensive. So if you're a very serious astronomer and this is where you want your focus to be, and you live in a very good place to see planets, and actually Houston's not bad, um, you might someday invest in a, in a very good quality refractor, both for observing with your eyes and for uh, imaging. But this one is on, say, is, is thousands of dollars. So um, the all-purpose Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, which is great for all around observing, is a decent telescope for planetary observing. It will follow the sky for you. It has a relatively long focal length of about F10. And so this one is fine also. And what I use right now, I have a home-built um, Dobsonian, which uses Newtonian optics. So the mirror is at the very bottom. The light comes, hits there, it hits a secondary mirror and comes out the side. And these can come in very short focal ratios, um, especially the largest telescopes. That's not ideal for planetary observing, but some of the smaller apertures come maybe at, at least F6, and that's adequate for, for looking at planets. Um, I use an F7 telescope, um, and it turns out to have just superb optics for planetary observing. I finally broke down because this does not follow the sky for you, and the planet will drift out eventually. And I bought an Ethos 8 millimeter eyepiece. So if you're going to look at planets quite a bit or show them to children a lot, um, a, this is a very expensive eyepiece. It actually costs as much as the telescope but I just get drop dead beautiful images. And the combination of the telescope and the eyepiece in the scheme of things is not uh, terribly expensive, not nearly as, as expensive as a refractor. So I found this eight millimeter ethos, the eight millimeters is the focal uh, length of the eyepiece, um, is, is a, good, um, a good kind of middling mid magnification for all purpose planetary observing. So for planetary observing, if you buy a telescope, you'll often have a high power eyepiece and a low power. A very simple telescope might have a 10 millimeter and a 25 millimeter. The lower numbers are the higher powers and those are what you want to put on the planet. Um, but you need probably in the seven to eight millimeter range for most planetary observing for decent nights. Um, rarely, you can go down to four or five millimeters. You need an exceptionally good night of seeing, which we will discuss in a minute. Um, but if you go much below 13 millimeters, then the planetary image gets very small, or much above, I should say, in terms of, um, of the millimeters, but that's lower magnification. So this gives you an idea of why for any night, um, there is a limit to how much you can magnify a planet. And for any aperture of telescopes, so the aperture again is how wide the the mirror or the lens is that's gathering the light. At some point, the atmospheric disturbance, um, just from looking through the turbulence of the atmosphere, will disturb the image. And you are also spreading out the light. So Saturn's light is the same, whether you have it 50 times, 100 times, 250 or 500 times. That light gets spread out. And it will also eventually blur if you use too much magnification. So the maximum amount of magnification you can use in any one evening may vary. And usually the practical magnification of your telescope is about 50 times the aperture in inches. So if you have a five inch telescope, the maximum practical magnification would be about 250 times. Um, aperture can make a difference in planetary viewing. Um, you can see that you get a lot more detail in a larger telescope, but a larger telescope can also magnify the problems in the atmosphere. So there's sort of pluses and minuses both ways. But if you have ideal seeing, and we'll discuss that in a minute, um, then a larger telescope is going to give you more detail. So good seeing, what, uh, when is it and what is it? Seeing is the degree of the turbulence in the atmosphere. Um, so when you have, for instance, a cold front passing through, there can be quite a bit of, of, of uh, turbulence from the the cold meeting the warm air. And it's actually not a terribly good time to look at the planet. It's a little bit like looking at a penny in a swimming pool and the waves distort that view of the penny as you look at it through the, through the water. Um, 
But however, Houston's weather, like tonight, which can be very hot and sticky and not much motion in the air at all, is actually very good for planetary viewing. So getting to know planets is we're in a really good place for doing that here in Houston. Um, as far as uh, a temperature inversion, where you have warm air overlying cooler air, also minimize the amount of, of motion in the atmosphere. And the other thing, consideration, why I was talking about what time the planet is up highest in the sky at opposition at midnight, is how much atmosphere you're looking through. So if you're looking closer to the horizon, you're looking through 40 times as much atmosphere as when you're looking at overhead. So the best time to look at the planet is when the air is very still. Um, you, it might actually be a little hazy. There's no cold front that's just passed and it's higher up in the sky. Now for planetary viewing, a lot of people like to use colored filters. The view is not gonna be beautiful, but if you're really trying to get a lot of detail in specific areas of the planet, these different filters will emphasize different uh, parts of the planet. So for instance, there are filters which will make Mars's ice cap show up better or Mars's dark patches show up better or Jupiter's band show up better um, or the rings have more definition. And uh, these screw onto the bottom of the eyepiece and eyepieces have conventional diameters. Uh, most are one and a quarter inches in diameter. And for larger telescopes that are now standardized at two inches, they're even starting to come out with three inch eyepieces for very large telescopes. So if you buy some colored filters, they're very modestly priced, 25 to $35, uh, you need to make sure that the diameter matches the diameter of your eyepieces. Uh, you can also find charts online. I found this one yesterday at aginaastro.com, which tell you which uh, filter for each planet brings out which, uh, which, um, which are the best details it sees. So there are people who sometimes draw the planets and they will change out filters, maybe one for ice caps, another one for bands, um, and one by one uh, increase the contrast of those features and draw them and then in Toto have a really beautiful high detail drawing. Um, Galileo is the first person to not invent the telescope, but the first person to decide the point uh, what was used terrestrially in the past at the sky. And he uh, discovered the, the moons of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn. So he confirmed the four largest moons in January 1610. This is his journal and you can see he was drawing Jupiter and its moons, uh, sometimes in different positions. That's why Jupiter is fun to look at. We can always see the four Galilean moons, the four largest moons, and they are constantly changing position. Um, here is a, uh, a transcription of that same page. And uh, you can see each night he was uh, noting, noticing the positions of the, of the moons. Most of the time we see four, but there are times when we only see three or two, and that would be if a moon is directly in front of Jupiter or directly behind. And that's one of the most fun things to look at uh, when you observe Jupiter. This is probably the degree of uh, acuity he had with this very small uh, rude telescope. Um, not much better than we can do with binoculars. And with binoculars, you can actually get an impression of Saturn's rings and Jupiter's moons, but you can't see them especially well, but you can tell that they're there. Um, Jupiter, if you get to know it, has certain regions. It's got these alternating dark and light bands. If you have a small telescope, the ones you will notice first are the very large North Equatorial Belt and South Equatorial Belt. These are thick, dark bands, and usually also the North Temperate Belt. With the larger aperture, you'll start to see more detail in these other bands. And uh, you can find uh, maps of these on, on various sites. So the zones are this alternating light and dark appears to be higher clouds, which are the wider areas, which have ammonia ice in them and lower layers. And this is a uh, animation made by Don Parker, um, who was one of the earlier very good imagers of, uh, of Jupiter and Saturn, although now since he passed away, the imaging equipment has gotten so much better. But uh, he lived in Florida, which has Houston's hot sticky weather, and that's one of the best places to uh, observe planets, and he was an expert observer there. So this shows that 
uh, Jupiter rotates in only a little under 10 hours, nine hours and 50 minutes. So that means even within an hour or so, you will see different features. Um, Jupiter's red spot is a highly desirable feature to look at. Uh, you can see how fast it moves only in 30 minutes in, in these two images by one of our members, Bill Flanagan. Um, but it can also spend five hours on the far side of the planet where we can't see it. So you can get, go online and find great red spot transit times. There are apps for all of these things, or I often will just simply Google um, great red spot trans transit and excuse me, <clears throat> great red spot transit times, and you can get some charts. Now, whenever we look at anything that's transient, that has a time expressed, this times are always expressed in universal time. So that's a time in Greenwich, uh, England, not here in Houston, Texas. And that way they're able to express it in a single time and worldwide, any observer can take that time and make the correction for their time zone. So in Houston, and, and uh, in the summer, daylight saving time, or now it's eight months of the year, we are at minus five. So we would have to take these numbers and subtract five. Notice they're on a 24 hour clock. So if there's something that happens at 1802, um, that's gonna be a, a, at 102 in the afternoon for us, 1302. So obviously we're not gonna be able to see that event, but the one that's at 357 in the morning um, in England is still at nighttime for us, 1057 PM. So you do need to know to make those corrections when we are in the winter at central standard time, the correction for Houston is minus six hours. So these cloud bands are in flux. They're actually um, changing. And um, as we can see, they move in opposite directions at very high speeds, 200 to 400 miles an hour types of winds. And this is what spins up these oval storms and causes these very um, kind of serrated edges to the bands. As the wind shear is tremendous on Jupiter. So um, also we can have really weird phenomenon where an a equatorial belt disappears. I think I remember seeing this entirely. Um, some kind of space weather can happen on Jupiter to, to uh, cause these very unusual events. Um, the names of these kind of scallop shapes are festoons. This sketch was made in 1872. So the, I looked at the definition of festoon. Why are they called festoons? And um, usually it, what it is is kind of a scalloped decorative shape. So um, in, in dentistry, it can be your scallop gums around your teeth. Um, but it's that scallop shape for which the festoons are, are named for it and normally considered decorative, but there is a such thing as non-decorative festoons. So Jupiter's ovals, besides a great red spot, there's a junior red spot, and you'll also find some smaller white spots. These are sort of like upside down hurricanes. They are normally high pressure storms, and they can persist from months to years. So the great red spot has been going at least 400 years that we know of. And they can um, also collide. So here is a um, kind of a timed, uh, uh, you notice the FA oval, becomes closer and closer and eventually becomes a part of the BE oval they can combine. So if you really are into looking at these things, you can start to see these changes on Jupiter. Um, this is just a pretty view of ovals uh, as seen from spacecraft Voyager 1 and from Juno, the more recent uh, current uh, uh, spacecraft. And uh, beautiful images, are start, uh, the images we're getting now, which I, there's some really recent ones are like incredibly detailed paintings. So we now have a much better idea of what it might look like to see Jupiter if we were actually in a spacecraft. Um, another thing to look at with Jupiter's moons are the moons transiting and you can usually see them on the very edge as a white dimple. One, on one night of very good seeing, I was able to actually see the moon go onto the surface of Jupiter, even with my eight inch telescope. Um, but normally it disappears from view when it's transiting in front of it, but the black shadows are very easy to see. So um, we have moon transits or, or Jovian satellite transits, and we also have the transits of their shadows. 
And um, we can also have Jupiter hit by comets. Um, in fact, we think maybe Jupiter has saved us, the Earth, from being hit by comets in more recent years. Um, Jupiter probably sweeps comets from our path. Uh, those of us who are amateur astronomers in 1994 were treated to seeing the impact of this broken up comet, which hit Jupiter and caused all these black scars, which have now dissipated. There's also white flashes. Um, we can have things hitting Jupiter. And um, so here's one that was captured in, in an image. And here's another one. Um, with the comet hitting Jupiter, uh, that there was this wonderful graphic here, Terra from Jupiter. But again, for us, this may be why we have intelligent life on Earth. Um, Jupiter probably protects us from being wiped out by a comet or asteroid um, as, and clears things out for us. Um, these are the four Galilean moons up close, Eo, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And that is an order of their distance from Jupiter, not necessarily the order that you will see them in the telescope, though, as they're passing in front, in front of and behind Jupiter. Um, notice that they look a little bit different. Um, Eo was known as a pizza planet when we first uh, got a close-up image of it. It's very volcanic. That's due to tidal forces. It's very close to Jupiter, and so close that Jupiter actually tugs a little bit more on its front side than its back side. Plus, it has all of the other moons of Jupiter pulling it apart from the backside. So it's literally being torn apart all the time and is actually um, he heavily volcanic. Europa is a little bit farther out. And so it looks um, like it still has a young surface, again, because it's uh, experiencing tidal forces and is of interest to us. Hopefully we'll hear more about that tomorrow um, because people think there may be an underground ocean and it's worth exploring. And this is a planned space mission to Europa. Ganymede is a little bit um, farther out again. So it, we're getting to, to a more uh, familiar cratered surface. And Callisto is farther out yet. So it's a much more static surface. So this is a typical small telescope view. Actually, I think you can get a little bit um, better view of, of the bands. In a small telescope, it looks a little bit brighter. Um, and the, the moons will be strung out roughly in line because Jupiter is not very tilted. So we're usually looking fairly directly at its equator. Um, we can also have eclipses on Jupiter. And what this would mean is, is a moon's shadow can eclipse another moon. And that can happen for a few months at a time every five or six years. And we happen to be in one of those periods right now. So between March and November, we are looking at Jupiter at the correct angle to get eclipses. I didn't research, we should probably, I should have researched what's the next eclipse um, uh, opportunity this month, but, but I'm sure there are, are uh, there's information online. These are a lot of fun to look at because what would happen is the moon that's being eclipsed would dim out when the eclipse happens. Uh, the eclipses were also used to determine uh, that the speed of light is finite. So the timing of eclipses in the 1670s of Eo at different distances um, when the Earth was on different sides of uh, different distances from Jupiter, um, those timings came out a little bit different. Eo, um, here's a picture of a shadow transit. And this shows you, um, this is just information here, that the inner three moons are in resonance. So the, um, the each moon uh, subsequently outward goes twice as, as uh, slowly as the other moon. So they're in a one to two to four resonance. If you were to translate to music, that would be three octaves because each octave vibrates twice as fast as the, as the previous one. Um, here, this gives you an idea of line of sight that causes these shadow transits. So the the, usually we can, the, the moon's line of sight and the shadow's line of sight are different. So sometimes you might see the moon still not quite hitting Jupiter, but we will see its shadow on Jupiter. There was a rare shadow transit, a triple shadow transit. Those happen much more rarely, many years apart in 2015, and also one more recently. Now to find out when all of these events are gonna happen, you can find uh, charts for each month of what we call 
Jupiter's Jovian satellite event. So you can look up Jupiter moon events or if you want to be fancy Jovian satellite events. And let me just go over some of these uh, shorthands here. The Roman numerals one, two, three, and four are the order are EO, Europa, Ganymede, and we don't see a, a Roman numeral four, but if it was here, it'd be Callisto. And SHA stands for shadow. So this says there's an EO shadow transit starting at 108 on December 6th, and that would be universal time. So five hours earlier for us. And um, then it looks then not too much longer after that, the actual moon starts to transit Jupiter. And then we have the end of the shadow transit and the end of the moon transit. And when the, it's a lot of fun to watch a moon go um, begin to touch Jupiter and also the exit because you actually sense some sense of, uh, of movement. It's a little bit like watching a minute hand on a clock, but you really, you really get the sense that you're watching a solar system proceed in its orbit. Um, here we have an eclipse start. The ECL is eclipse. That would mean, again, a shadow is falling on something. An occultation is when a moon actually crosses another moon or where, where, where um, uh, that, that means something's passing in front of something or where Jupiter occults the, shat, the, the moon. And, um, and then again, so, so to summarize, SHA stands for shadow, TRA is transit, ECL is eclipse, and OCC is an occultation. Um, the best occultation of their own of them all, if you have a chance to see the moon, uh, occult either Jupiter or Saturn. Uh, I've seen a Saturn occultation. It's really spectacular. And for more information on Jupiter, and also this is going to apply to Saturn, there is an association of lunar and planetary observers called ALPO. Its website is alpo-astronomy.org. A very good resource if you want to become a serious planetary observer. Sky and Telescope magazine will give you, um, has articles periodically about Jupiter and Saturn, and will give you information about events for that particular month. Wikipedia is actually a great astronomical reference. If you want to know any statistics, Wikipedia is terrific. Uh, Astronomy magazine also provides great information and space.com. Um, I just want to end the Jupiter section uh, with a beautiful photo um, from Juno. So observe Jupiter. Now proceeding on to Saturn, um, Saturn is even farther away. So it's really especially great to see it near opposition. We need that uh, closeness to Saturn to get a decent size image. It's not gonna look large in a telescope, um, but you can see quite a bit of detail on a good night. Here's a beautiful image of Saturn by Bill Flanagan. It's named for the God of agriculture or actually it was a Titan. And it's the second largest planet after Jupiter as far as the planet itself. Um, here it is compared to the sun. But as far as taking up the most space, the rings of Saturn would almost take us from the earth to the moon. So uh, that average distance is 239,000 miles and Saturn's ring width is only a little bit shorter than that. Saturn's also the only planet that could float. It's only it's the only planet that's less dense than water, 0.6. Um, its density is 0.6 if we had an ocean large enough, which we don't. Um, so its orbit is over 29 years. So again, we overtake it every year. It's not that Saturn moves so far when we become to opposition. And its day, similar to um, Jupiter's, is 10 hours and 14 minutes, although Saturn does not have those really well-defined features to follow. It looks, uh, that's, that looks pretty much the same, uh, whatever time of day you're looking at it. It's nine and a half times as far away from the sun as Earth. So that's nine and a half astronomical units or about, uh, little, about 891,000 miles away from the sun. And uh, that's almost twice as far away as Jupiter is. And it was last, it was at opposition on August 2nd. So now it's a terrific time to look at Saturn. Its tilt is about 27 degrees. So this gives us a lot of varying views of Saturn's rings, which I will talk about in a minute. It also has an atmosphere mostly of hydrogen and helium, similar to stars. And interestingly, its gravity is about the same as Earth's. So what is it made of? 
Um, it's uh, again hydrogen and helium, pretty similar to uh, to Jupiter, except it also has some ammonia and uh, methane in its atmosphere, and it has a very small rock or metal core, and also has some metallic hydrogen in it. Um, so the ring system, which I will show you a little bit closer up later, is we believe may have been a moon that never coalesced or a broken up moon, and it's made out of um, pieces of uh, ice mostly that can range up to about the size of a grain of sand up to about the size of a house. Um, it's at opposition now. Again, here's the geometry. So here's Earth and the sun is this way and Saturn's this way up at as high as it's going to get at midnight. And here's Saturn's um, path. Um, so we again are in 2021. So these are the pink dates. And again, here's a uh, very small here, but here's August, we're right in the middle of the retrograde. Uh, and uh, here it is in the sky. It's right now in the constellation Capricornus. If you're in a dark sky, um, it's to the left of Sagittarius, the teapot, and it's, or to the east. And it's also, um, I recognize it as kind of a, a sagging triangle of an outline of stars. It's not a terribly prominent constellation, but that shape can be seen in a dark sky. So um, we have Scorpius, which looks like a, a very distinctive can opener, then Sagittarius, which the upper part looks like a teapot with a handle and a spout. And then to the left of that, the next constellation is Capricornus with this kind of drooping triangle shape. Um, this shows you the geometry of the rings as uh, Saturn orbits up the sun and also us and explains why when Saturn is in say the 2017 and 2003 position, we see the most open rings and when it's 2009 and it'll be 2025 for us, we would see the most closed rings. Unfortunately, the 2025 um, view of the, of the very closed rings is gonna to be too close to the sun for us to see well. So here's an image by Sonny Manley, who's here tonight. And um, he made some beautiful images from 2018 through 2021 to show that we went from very open rings in 2018, and now we're on the way to closing until they will be edge on in 2025. Um, here, this gives you an idea, again, of all the different uh, apparitions of Saturn. And it, this ring opening closing is on a 28 year cycle. So it's 13 years on the south side, back to most open, back to close, and then 15 years on the north side to go very open and then close again. Um, it turns out, I was just looking up today, I wanted to see it again because I have seen the rings edge on, or I should say I've not seen them, because what happens when they get edge on, they disappear entirely for one week. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to see them just before disappearance and just before reappearance. They almost look like a, a linear, bright, just kind of a bright pencil. Um, so we will not have another opportunity until 2038 to see the rings disappear just because Saturn will be too close to the sun next time around. Um, however, oppositions are great times to see all of these different tilts of the rings. Um, again, the rings uh, system, we talked compared it to the earth moon distance, it's about 21 earth diameters um, for the total ring system and the thickness is about four and a half earth diameters. And also when you're looking at it in a telescope, the things you will notice first are the larger black, kind of the, the whole, the gap in the rings called the Cassini division and a little bit larger telescope, the Anki division will be the next one to show up, um, which is a thinner gap in, in the rings. Um, there are subtle um, changes in color from north to south. And sometimes there are occasional storms, uh, which can be noticed, but Saturn does not change, have dramatic features. Um, its drama is more in its texture and in the ring system. In a, on a, on a dark sky with a small telescope even, you can see up to five moons. In a bright sky, normally only Titan, the brightest moon will show up, but if you see one decent, decent dot in your telescope or kind of a steady white dot near Saturn, um, and that's all you see, it's likely to be the moon Titan. Um, but even my five inch telescope in a dark sky can also see Dion, Mimas, Enceladus, Tethys, and Ray. Um, so how do you know which moon is which? Well, there are apps to do that. You can download Saturn moon. There's one for um, Android. There's one for 
Apple or Sky and Telescope has a tool. And um, what you need to know about these apps is that each telescope um, flips Saturn differently depending on what kind of optics you have. So you can choose direct view, um, which probably your telescope doesn't do an inverted view upside down, or uh, which will work if you have a Newtonian telescope or a mirror reverse view. And it even tells you what kind of uh, telescopes that works best for. Or you can be very good at those spatial relation tests where you flip it in your mind. Um, but, uh, if it, but you will see at least a relative distance and, uh, and orientation to Saturn and its rings. And you can get these real time. Um, now I'm going to have just a little bit about Saturn discovered more by the spacecraft. We now know that the rings have shepherd moons. That's why they're held together um, in the shape of why there's also gaps. Um, these rings seem to, these moons create some resonances which keep the particles in their paths. Um, we, if we were very close to the rings, we believe this is something that you would see. They're only about a mile thick. That's why they disappear entirely um, when Saturn is, uh, when, when we look at them edge on. And most of what we know about Saturn came from the Cassini mission. Um, and Carolyn Porco was the project manager for that. So I'm going to end the talk with just some pretty, uh, pretty pictures from Saturn's uh, Path, uh, the, the missions to Saturn. And one more uh, visual observation I would like to mention, Stephen O'Mara, who spoke of the Texas Star Party, is known for his acute, his uh, incredibly acute vision. And before Voyager went, he drew uh, these cross, these dark kind of, uh, uh, these dark shadows going across the rings, which people insisted did not exactly, did not exist. By the way, notice in his drawing that he has exaggerated contrast. That's what people do when they draw something, they're trying to get the information. So this is purposely exaggerated contrast to draw out the detail. When Voyager uh, went to Saturn, sure enough, we saw these same, same details. Um, if you wanna become a planetary observer, I should mention a little bit about how Stephen O'Mara does it. He, he considers himself an athlete. I'm sure his eyesight is excellent, but he also spends a lot of time with every, every object that he looks at and trying to find smaller and smaller and more minute details. You can train your eye to see things that are very small and difficult to notice over time. So just want to mention that, that we have, if you really are a very acute observer, you may be able to see things that nobody else can. And we uh, this is an old slide. I can't remember what the most recent uh, count is for Saturn, um, but Saturn has many, many moons and they continue to be discovered. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system after Ganymede and is the only moon you can see in a very small telescope around Saturn. And it's has a, uh, it's the also one that the only one that has an atmosphere, which is 95% nitrogen. And I'm just gonna go quickly through some of these. Uh, this is just pretty pictures. Um, this goes beyond what we can see in our telescopes. Um, but uh, these uh, things that we've discovered, geysers, possibly undersurface oceans, are the, what of our interest for our next space mission. So those will be talked about tomorrow. Um, here's a beautiful view of the Earth from Saturn. Here's a storm. And we also found this uh, at the, one of Saturn's poles. And this hexagonal shape was a puzzle. And the kinked ring, which we think was uh, some kind of uh, uh, resonance. And there's also an exoplanet, which is a super Saturn, which we believe is a small planet with just an enormous ring system. And wouldn't that be cool to see Saturn like this? Uh, one last thing I would like to mention, since this is August, we have the peak of the Perseids meteor shower on August 12th, 13th. It's usually good, especially good for about three nights running. Um, it's called the Perseids because it's radiant is in Perseus. This does not mean that the, that all of the meteors are in Perseus. It, they can be anywhere in the sky. It means that if you trace the path of the meteor backwards, 
it would its path would point at Perseus. There's usually another meteor shower that's much more sparse called the Cygnets, which are usually slower, brighter meteors at the same time as the Perseids. And those would have paths that go toward a completely different constellation. You can tell if it's a Cygnet, Cygnet or a Perseid, depending on which direction that path goes. Um, the best time to watch a meteor shower is after midnight, because it's a little bit like raindrops hitting your windshield. So when the windshield's facing into the raindrops, we're facing into this cometary debris. Um, we get hit by a lot more debris. Uh, the back windshield gets something, but it gets a lot less. Uh, Steve Goldberg today, and I think also Bill Pellerin, posted that there is going to be a remote observing of Perseids meteors from McDonald Observatory on August 11th, I believe, um, at uh, it's in the earlier part of the evening, so there may be fewer meteors, but on the other hand, um, it's in a very, very dark sky, so I imagine it'll be quite good. And then finally, I'm going to leave you with this uh, uh, beautiful photo of Saturn eclipsing the sun taken, taken by Cassini. And I'm going to go ahead and stop my share, and I'm going to allow you guys to unmute in case there's any questions. I think I've done that. So um, I didn't have anybody to monitor a chat. I think I see something in there though. Um, oh, we have, some, have a question. Can someone tell me where I can find recordings of past meetings? Um, they are on, at astronomyhouston.org. If you're a member, you're able to log in, um, establish a password, and then you can log in. Once you log in, the first screen that comes up will have a rectangle to the right. And one of the entries in that rectangle will say rec um, recorded HAS presentations, and they're all listed there. Let me see if I have any other uh, chats. Um, there's a reminder here that you can go to so public viewing at ins Insperity Observatory tomorrow night at 10 p.m. That's in North Houston. You might check out the website in the chat. Um, one great thing about uh, Planetary observing, it's nice to go to some star parties because you'll have a variety of telescopes, but it's not something you have to go to a dark sky to see. So we can have all the light pollution in the world. Um, it's a great part of our hobby that you can do in your backyard. And if there's anybody else, let's see, two new messages. Um, oh, I've been asked which one of the two is my personal favorite to observe and why. It's hard to pick a favorite. Um, they are, I mean, Saturn is responsible for getting more people into astronomy than anything else. It's by far, it's the most beautiful, but I think I prefer Jupiter for all of the moon events and um, uh, the, just the, the big changes you can see. Um, oh, the best direction to view the Perseid meteor. So there's no best direction for a meteor shower. You can look anywhere in the sky, but as the constellation Perseus gets higher in the sky, we will be seeing meteors on both sides of it. But there is no single best direction. Um, we are going through a um, kind of a sea of cometary debris. It's just that the, the path can lead back to toward Perseus, but it can be completely on the other sky from Perseus. So the best thing is to get uh, a comfortable chair, reclining chair, and just focus on one part of the sky and look for them. One thing about per, uh, meteor showers, they're not really showers, except for the few meteor storms that there are. Um, so when you talk about good shower, like uh, for the Perseids, they still may be averaging only one a minute. So a 60 to 80 an hour is only a little bit over one a minute on average, but sometimes they will come in clusters. Um, but you do need some patience and you need a dark sky because the, the only persons you can see are the ones that are as bright as the stars you can see. So if you can only see 10 stars, you're only gonna see the very brightest meteors and those may be few and far between. So dark sky after midnight, any part of the, the sky. And oh yes, someone has mentioned that about the West Texas Dark Sky Reserve, which took a lot of coordination from uh, Bill Wren and McDonald Observatory. They had to get seven counties to agree to have um, lighting ordinances, and it will be one of the largest dark sky controlled areas in the country. Uh, seven large, large uh, very, going all the way from McDonald Observatory to Big Bend, seven very large counties, and that's a huge. Um, huge uh, victory. One thing we had to do, uh, and I've noticed some resistance in Brewster County, is uh, we need to convince people 
that, that they need mm -hmm. to understand that LED lighting, if it's misused, is far, uh, far worse for light pollution than any other light source we've had. It's wider and brighter, and uh, one person can impact a large amount of sky. When I went to Katy Prairie uh, Conservancy, a person who lives out there told me a single home two miles away was pointing outward some white LED lighting, and they could see it from there. Um, any, you're also welcome to unmute if anyone wants to. And uh, when we're when we've run out of questions, we'll uh, we'll uh, end the meeting. Um, someone said, um, and you said the eight millimeter eyepiece is the best for planetary viewing. In my telescope, I I know that it will handle the eight millimeters. I have down to four point four. millimeters. I have yeah. a six point four. So oh, the yeah, eight is a great uh, medium eyepiece um, where you know, it will handle most evenings. And I see uh, no, Mr. Pepper there. You have a question? You got a pet oh. question? Okay, I was trying to write it in, but really. Do you have any pictures of the shadow of the rings on Jupiter, on Saturn? Yeah, actually, that's a fun thing to look at, is, as we can see through our telescopes, the shadows yeah. of Saturn on the uh, We can see Saturn's shadow on the rings in certain orientations. Well, both ways, yeah. 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 That's fun to look at, actually. Um, so Saturn changes. The big changes on Saturn are the tilt of its rings and the positions of the five moons. And, and just its sheer beauty. I, I have to tell a story, um, my favorite uh, story is my Sadie story. I was at the George Observatory on the deck and it was a great night for Saturn, but we needed, it was fairly high up, we needed about three steps to get the little kids up there. And there was this little three-year-old girl with blonde curls who was just terrified. And we, we were like, she's got to see Saturn. She was crying and crying, did not want to see Saturn. We finally got her up there. And when she got up there, she took a really long look. And then when the line proceeded, every fourth or fifth person was Sadie for about five or six times. So I've had a lot of people tell me if they join the club, they said, boy, it's when I saw Saturn. But we're, we're just lucky we have a Saturn. I'm like, what kind of solar system would it be those poor people who don't have Saturns to look at? Um, Year, years ago, I managed to see, and this has to be 30 years ago, the uh, the moon going in front of Saturn. Yes, I saw that, that too. Back I, in the I, 70s. Yeah, and that is stunning. You, I mean, you see it, like yeah, the, the rings disappear like the in the planet. It was so huge. Just, I don't know how it gave you a feeling of depth, probably all in your head, but still, it, uh, I always remember that. Yeah, Thank so, you so what, much for the person. So what he's saying is that, you know, you normally when you think about the sky, it looks so static to us, naked eye. Um, the fun thing about watching planets and occultations, I gave another presentation on occultations. When you start seeing that motion in the sky, things are changing and moving. That's one of my fa favorite things to see. That's why Jupiter actually may be almost more fun to watch than Saturn, because uh, you can see change, a lot of changes, even just an hour. Um, Debbie, so, I have a and, question. Yes, Peggy. Uh, yes. So um, I noticed your daub. Is it an Aptura? Is it an Aptura daub? Oh, you know, I had never heard of that. It had some good reviews. I'm not familiar with that daub. So oh. my personal one is a home built, and I bought a. We, my my uh, brother has an Orion. Is it Star Skymaster? I forget what the Ryan is. Mm -hmm. That's good, but I I'm not sure. I don't actually know anything about that telescope. So I was I thought, oh, maybe I better go to a, a brand I know. Uh, but but it had these five star reviews. But I I'm not sure if those were seasoned uh, astronomers or not. I'm not familiar with the brand. Well, let but me ask you a question. Which is a great size. Have Have you ever taken pictures uh, through your daub? So um, through a dog, a dog will not do adequate pictures of planets, but I've definitely had someone take good pictures of the moon. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't even have one of, now there's devices that hold the cell phone at exactly the right angle to get the focus. But so one woman lucked out, with, she, she tried several times at the star party at the Westbury Community Garden, and she got just a spectacularly good moon fo fo uh, photo. I mean, it looks like it's you know, professional <laughs> done through the telescope really great resolution so that's possible i've heard i have not tried with the plants but i've heard someone tell me that's 
less satisfactory. And the really terrific uh, images you see are done with some of these newer uh, CMOS and, and very $30,000 worth of equipment, but the HAS actually has that for our use. So if someone trains on it, one of our telescopes at the observatory site is equipped for excellent imaging. Oh, cool. That's good to know. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. It was great. Oh, you're welcome. So I, I see something from David Brown about ap Apertura. So if there are any more questions, if not, I think we can go ahead and end. Um, anyway, thanks so much for coming. This should be posted on, um, I don't think we did Facebook Live today, but it was recorded and uh, I'll have Joe edit it and it'll be posted soon. So thanks so much.